Well, um, welcome to our uh, closing session for the uh, spring uh, 2013 CNI uh, member meeting. I hope you've had a very informative uh, day and a half and that you've also had uh, some opportunities to catch up with old friends and colleagues and to meet some new ones. I have to say, um, it's always a little frustrating for me because um, uh, I, I try and you know check in on most of the breakout sessions, and um, I've seen some wonderful, wonderful things, uh, most of which I couldn't stay through all the way. Um, uh, but um, at least based on what I've seen, I hope that you've had a really tremendous um, uh, time at this meeting. And uh, I was delighted to see the weather cooperated last night, so I hope um, uh, some of you managed to get out of the hotel a little bit and enjoy some of it. I just have a few very brief bits of housekeeping to see to before um, I introduce our closing plenary. Um, I'll just mention that, uh, to uh, remind you that we've done away with printed evaluations and you'll be getting an email with a URL to a um, meeting evaluation form uh, shortly. Um, so uh, keep your eye open for that. In your packet, you have a list of upcoming dates for our December 2013 and December 2014 meetings. Both of those will be held at the Capitol Hilton in uh, Washington, D.C. And I hope you'll be able to join us for those. Uh, you also have the date for next spring's meeting, which will be in uh, St. Louis, um, a city we've uh, not been to before, um, and uh, which I hope you'll be able to join us in. I want to um, ask for a round of applause for our breakout speakers. Um, uh, this is always so much the core of the meeting, and I think we really had an extraordinary set this time. And I'd like you to join me in thanking everyone who contributed to those breakouts. We have been, I will also just mention, um, changing the way we capture some bits of the meeting. For the opening and closing plenaries, we do um, uh, full-scale video capture, and those go up on the web, as many of you know, and we're continuing to do that. And um, this meeting will be uh, televised, as it were. Um, but um, we have moved to a different system for the breakouts that we capture. We don't try and capture all of the breakouts, but um, we're using a uh, voiceover um, uh, PowerPoint um, system for that. That's allowed us to capture um, more uh, videos than or, or capture more breakouts than we've been able to do in the past. And um, I think that uh, you'll appreciate this because it will give you a, um, a richer set of resources to share with colleagues and to um, use yourself on our website. Uh, one of the byproducts of that is that um, it's been a little more challenging to get everything going, and I'd like to take a moment to thank um, the volunteers from the University of Texas at, um, uh, at um, uh, San Antonio Library who um, were kind enough to help us get all of that rolling. Um, your help is very much um, appreciated. Finally, I'd like to say a thanks to the CNI staff um, who uh, have done their usual amazing job at making everything happen from registration to, um, uh, to technology to scheduling to everything else. Um, and I'd ask you to please join me in thanking them uh, for their help.
A final scheduling note um, before I forget. There is one upcoming date that is not in your packet, although it often is at this meeting. That's the date for the next International Digital uh, Curation Conference. Um, that's because we haven't set the date yet. It will be um, in early 2014, probably the January, February timeframe. And as soon as we have that nailed down, I will be sending out, of course, a hold the date announcement to CNI announce. So watch for that one. Now, um, that was fairly uh, brief, I hope, and not too painful. Um, and allows me to turn to introducing our closing um, plenary session, which is going to present uh, the results, um, or at least the initial results. I have a feeling people are gonna be mining this data for um, some time to come. But uh, we're at least gonna get a look at the initial results from the Ithaca um, faculty um, survey from 2012. Um, this is going to be the first release of these results, and I'm very eager to uh, see what um, surprises um, are lurking in here. Uh, to take us through this, we have um, Roger Schoenfeld and Deanna Markham, both from um, uh, Ithaca SNR. Uh, Deanna has um, fairly recently, after um, uh, doing wonderful service on all of our behalf at the Library of Congress, um, uh, come to Ithaca as the managing director of SNR. Um, you should be familiar with Roger's work. Um, he's a program director there and has um, written a large number of um, reports and studies on uh, all kinds of fascinating things, um, uh, uh, which I'm sure you've had a chance to look at. They're joined by Judy Russell from um, the University of Florida, who um, is wearing a couple of hats here. Uh, she, um, she was a member of the advisory committee for the study. Um, she's going to, as a leader in um, academia and uh, in the research library circles, um, give some reaction to it. And she's also involved in piloting um, uh, a localization version of the study. And they'll explain more about this sort of um, localization strategy, which is a new development of this work that I think is exceedingly interesting. Um, so, without further ado, I will turn it over to um, our plenary speakers. Thank you, Cliff, and good afternoon, everyone. We're really delighted to be at CNI to present the 2012 faculty survey conducted in the United States. Um, the CNI audience will be the first to hear these findings, and we think it's particularly appropriate that this is the audience where we launch the, the results. I also want to thank uh, Cliff and Joan for including us in this plenary session. We are, uh, we've enjoyed the support of CNI for many years, and we're grateful for it, and uh, we're really pleased to be part of the program. Ithaca SNR has been conducting a survey of U.S. faculty every three years since the year 2000. So this is the fifth survey. Our goal has been to understand how scholarly practices and behaviors are changing, as well as to understand how there are expectations of and relationships with the organizations that support them libraries, publishers, and scholarly societies may be changing. The faculty survey is the quantitative part of our work, and we also have a qualitative component. Uh, we have been doing studies in disciplines to understand more about how faculty attitudes and behaviors are changing. We have completed the studies of the disciplines of history and chemistry. A study of art history is underway, and you can see here uh, the reports that have been published thus far. 
And we invite you to uh, look at these reports on our website and also to follow the qualitative studies that we're doing. Uh, these three are in progress or, or completed, but we have a number that we anticipate in, in the near future. There are several features of the faculty survey that are new this year, and so I want to go through those with you. Um, the first is that we've updated the methodology. Um, we've always done a paper survey until now, and this was the first year of doing an online survey, so we too have gone digital. We've used um, an advisory committee for this for this year's study, and we are very grateful to them. Um, this is also the first year we've had an international survey. That is, we've conducted a survey in the United States, we've conducted the same survey in the United Kingdom. That report is, is now in progress. We had committees in both instances. The U.S. Advisory Committee has been made up of librarians, publishers, and scholarly society executives. The U.K. Committee was formed by representatives of the research libraries of U.K. and JISC. And the fourth new feature is, that, um, is one Cliff alluded to. For the first time this year, we have piloted a project in the United States that allows individual institutions to run this survey on their own campuses. This allows individual institutions an opportunity to look at their, their faculty in comparison to the national findings. And you'll hear a little bit more about that later. One of the values of the triennial survey is that we track attitudes and behaviors over time. But in each survey cycle, we focus on a few questions or topics that seem particularly important at that time. Uh, we, in the 2012 survey, we looked more closely at the research processes, teaching practices, and the role of scholarly societies in addition to our perennial questions about research dissemination, communication, and the academic library. The US faculty survey will be officially released on Monday, April 8th, and uh, the UK findings will be available at the end of May. And just to be very clear with this audience, today we are talking only about the US survey findings. We are enormously grateful to the, uh, to the sponsors of our survey. Um, all of the institutions represented by these logos have made valuable contributions to the process, and we are, are most grateful to them. We are keenly aware that any time you see survey results, the great temptation is to go deeper and ask why. We have, we hope, several months now of engaging with you and many others uh, to try to explore the meaning of these results. But first, we begin with the results themselves. And so for the meaty part of the presentation, I turn to my colleague, Roger. Thank you. Um, thank you. I'm really thrilled to have the opportunity to share a little bit of, um, of, our, of some of the key findings from, from our project this cycle. And, um, and by way of beginning, let me start with just a few words about the methodology that, that we've utilized. Um, the population of the, of the survey focuses on faculty members from four-year colleges and universities um, here in the United States, uh, chosen from eight Carnegie classifications, and including all fields of study uh, arts and sciences, all the arts and sciences fields and many of the professions, with the key exceptions of uh, agriculture and health sciences, so no medicine, no nursing, and no agriculture. Uh, that's a historical uh, choice that we've made, um, at, least, at least in the past. Um, I want to really emphasize uh, something that Deanna said. We have transitioned to a digital methodology for the first time this year, and, um, and we really planned that quite carefully. Uh, following the 2009 
paper survey immediately following it, we conducted a digital pilot project to see whether the two methods would be comparable in terms of the types of responses that we received. And indeed, that they, they were to the extent that they gave us confidence moving forward in that direction. That's one of several ways that we, that we planned the, the, uh, the transition. And, um, and so we're confident that when you see um, when I'll show you some findings that track from 2009 or earlier up through fall 2012, that that's not somehow an artifact of the methodological shift, but rather that it would have to be explained by other factors. So in, in September, of, uh, earlier this academic year, we, uh, we emailed 160,000 invitations and reminders to a random, uh, randomly selected group of faculty members. Um, we received 5,261 responses for 3.5% response rate. Um, some of you will say, well, that's a low response rate. Um, and I want to just take a moment to, to, um, to emphasize that, of course, the rate of response is not the key uh, determinant in whether, in whether the results are interpretable, but rather whether they're representative of the, of the underlying population. Um, we've done, we've done a, a num taken a number of steps to, to check that and be sure that they are. We've done a little bit of disciplinary waiting um, as a result of that. Um, and what you'll see are not only findings in the aggregate, but also an ability for us to stratify by a number of key fields, uh, things like institutional type, by Carnegie classifications uh, 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 in the aggregate, um, and, uh, and disciplinary groupings where you'll see hum humanists and social scientists and, and scientists. Um, and just one, one quick note, uh, I'll, I'll often pre present findings where people are agreeing very strongly with a statement will be, will be how I'm saying it, or they feel very strongly about something. And what that means is that we ask them on a 10-point scale, and I'm giving you the share that have said an 8, 9, or 10 in response to that. So that's how we interpret very strong agreement for the purposes of, 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 of the analysis here today. So um, I'll, be, I'll be speaking about four uh, broad substantive uh, sections here. Um, one is discovery and access, uh, then dissemination, the role of the library, and finally the format transitions. Um, I want to uh, indicate that we have not covered today uh, three areas that are treated at some length in the, uh, the report that will be out on Monday just due to time constraints and an effort to try to uh, optimize for this audience here. Things like research topics and practices and collaboration, um, academic teaching uh, pre uh, uh, methods and practices, and then the role and value of the scholarly society. We have very interesting findings in, in those areas, but, but uh, not possible to include them today, unfortunately. So discovery and access is an area that we've been tracking in this, uh, this survey program for quite a number of years now. And, um, and I want to start with one of the questions that, that we've been tracking for, for quite some time so that you can see a trend line to get us, to get us started. Um, a question that may be familiar to some. Um, typically, when you are conducting academic research, which of these four starting points do you use to begin locating information for your research? Um, we looked at a specific electronic a research resource, a general purpose web search engine, your online library catalog, or the library building. Um, I know that the library building in particular, and even the idea of thinking of a library catalog as a standalone um, uh, tool, may feel a little bit dated, but it's important that we use the same language in the question to be able to track things over the course of time. So that's the, the, um, the trade-off that's being made there. And over the course of time, from 2003 to 2006 to 2009, we saw fairly a consistent trend of movement towards network level starting points, uh, the first two here that are listed, and away from uh, what you might consider to be the more local starting points. And so when I um, put up the slide of how things have changed, um, that pattern is actually interrupted in some very interesting, some very interesting ways. So, um, so let me draw your attention on the left to the specific electronic research resource where the, the, um, the growth in the share that reports starting there has been arrested and indeed even reversed just a very slight amount. Um, the general purpose search engine continues its seemingly inexorable uh, uh, increase. And the library catalog, which had been falling off gradually as a starting point, that fall off has been, again, arrested and just slightly reversed. Um, th there, there may be any number of, of explanations for, um, for the shift in the pattern that we're seeing in this cycle, but um, certainly the investments that libraries have been making in a variety of different kinds of discovery services and tools seems like it could be relevant in, in the context of that, that changing pattern. 
Now, at the same time, we know that the idea that there's a single starting point and that there could be a forced choice of where do you start is it's really a simplification for the purposes of tracking change over time. Um, in fact, 81% of our respondents uh, report that when they're looking for journal articles and monographs, they often use a variety of different sources, um, including the library and scholarly databases and mainstream search engines and so forth. And so, um, so I want to now complexify that, um, that sort of forced choice that we've been tracking over time with a few different ways of thinking about discovery that we've begun to try to um, analyze with this, uh, with this cycle of the survey. Um, so we've split, um, we've split discovery uh, searching behaviors into both known item searching first, and you can see the way that we've, uh, we've uh, framed the strongly worded, st uh, the, the question there, excuse me, um, as well as more exploratory uh, search for new journal articles and monographs, and you can see how we frame the question there. And then we've offered a number of different choices uh, whereby faculty members could respond that they are um, starting each of those two different types of, um, of, of, um, uh, of, of search processes. Things like uh, college or university library website or specific scholarly database or a general purpose search engine. And so um, you can see um, in, the, in, the, in the graph here that the, the difference between known item and exploratory searching um, it forms an interesting pattern. The green bar, which are the known items, um, are, are more likely to start, faculty members res respond that they're more likely to start at the library website, somewhat less likely to start at a scholarly database. Um, whereas for more exploratory searching with the blue bar, uh, they're more likely to start at a scholarly database and less likely to start at the library website. Um, just one or two other things to point out on, on, that, on that chart. Um, the, the role of asking a colleague, I'm going to come back to this in a moment, um, a, a, a trivial share of respondents indicate that they ask a colleague for either one of those kinds of discovery uh, 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 behaviors. And, um, and a similarly trivial share indicate that they ask a librarian, um, indicating that to the extent that librarians would like to be in the mix of these kinds of discovery behaviors, they probably will uh, be more likely to take place in some of the, uh, whether through a library website or other kinds of, of online or digital tools that may be made available. Now, um, now we also, are interested in what we've characterized here as keeping up with scholarship, but what, what we really mean there is current awareness. Um, and we have a whole lot of different things, and I don't want to. I, I want to really call your attention to two things. When we ask about when we ask scholars how they keep up with current scholarship in their field, the top two responses, the, the responses that the highest share indicate, um, are peer sources. And you'll recall in the previous item that peer sources were fairly. Um, irrelevant in the way that we'd frame that question. But for current awareness, um, attending conferences or workshops and reading materials suggested by other scholars come out right at the top. Now, they're not dramatically higher than um, skimming new issues of key journals and some other things, but they're, they're right up there at, at the top of the, of the list of options that we made available. I also want to point out one other thing on this, on this uh, list here, which is that, um, which is that Following other researchers through blogs and social media, I'm sorry, I went too far ahead there. Um, following other researchers through blogs and social media comes out at the, at the uh, bottom of the list of choices that we offered. So 12% of scholars report that that's a way that they keep up with the literature in their field. Um, and from a number of other questions that I, um, I don't have slides on today, but that we've, we've looked at in the report, um, we can see that scholars seem to be reporting the use of blogs and social media more as an author side tool than as a reader side tool. And that's a little bit interesting in trying to think about whether blogs and social media are being used as much to workshop new ideas and new projects or in-process projects as they are as sources for, for, you know, more canonical sources for the scholarly literature. Um, but certainly not at the top of the heap in terms of keeping up with scholarship. Now, finally, um, we asked scholars about how they feel about this mixture of different approaches and um, uh, tools and databases that they use to find and access materials. Just about a quarter reported that they're very frustrated with this, or they say it's very frustrating uh, to, to uh, this, this, uh, this circumstance. Uh, whether, whether you'll see that as uh, too high or comfortably low, um, I'll, I'll leave you to interpret yourself, but, um, but it's about a quarter that report it's very frustrating. 
Now, we also, I just want to share one slide about access, and this is about journals and books you routinely use, and the story that I want to tell you here is about freely available materials. Because when we ask scholars what their sources are for journals and books they routinely use, 78% um, indicated that their college or university libraries, collections, or subscriptions are, are a key source, um, but 65% indicated that materials that are freely available online um, are a key source. And you can see several other sources that are, are also important to uh, a notable share of faculty respondents. Um, now, con compare that with um, when, we, when we similarly asked faculty members what they think about how they source material that is not available to them through their college or university library. Um, and we were curious, you know, do they use interlibrary lending? What sorts of services or techniques do they use? Um, searching for freely available item online, freely available version online, is used by 86% of respondents. Um, library services like ILL, uh, 81%, and, and the list uh, goes, goes, down, um, goes down from there. 50% just give up and look for something else. These are faculty members. Um, and so, um, so you can see a very interesting picture beginning to emerge about the growth of, um, of, 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 of certain kinds of search techniques and clearly the importance, we don't have trend line data here, but the importance of um, a freely available material at least at least today or this academic year. Now dissemination is an area that we've been um, tr tracking in a certain ways for some time, but we've, we've added some additional uh, views into how research is being disseminated uh, by scholars. And in the first place, I'm going to share with you a slide about the audiences that, um, that's, that, that scholars um, are trying to reach. We asked about their subdiscipline, other scholars in their discipline, professionals um, outside of academia, scholars outside their discipline, the general public, and undergraduate students. And the audiences that scholars tell us they're trying to reach is overwhelmingly concentrated in their subdiscipline, in their discipline more generally, um, and especially with respect to the social scientists, uh, professionals uh, in, re in related fields outside of academia. Um, you can see that scholars outside their discipline, the general public and undergraduate students, um, are a, there's a smaller share of respondents, not a trivial share, but a smaller share trying to reach those, those other audiences. And the sciences fall notably lower on each of those three than, uh, than, uh, than the, other disciplinary, the other disciplinary groupings. Uh, now, now, secondly, we've, um, we've been tracking for some time um, decisions about where to publish, um, where to publish a journal article. Um, and I'll, I, I'm not going to show you the trend line data for this because it gets a, a little bit complicated. There's so much going on. But I do want to uh, show you th the ways in which the selection of a journal maps very nicely with the way that scholars report uh, the sorts of audiences that they're trying to reach. So um, you can see that the three uh, the three characteristics of a journal that are most important to, that are important to the highest share of respondents are close to my area of research, high impact factor, and circulated widely and well read by scholars in my field. Uh, that's in the range of um, 75 to 80 percent of respondents reporting that those are important characteristics. There are many other uh, characteristics that they also report are important. Um, I'd like to draw your attention to the fourth one, uh, published for free at about 65 percent of respondents. That's in other words, free for me to publish in the journal, free for me as the author. Um, and then down second from the bottom, the article is made freely available online at about 35% or about a third of respondents, saying that that's a very important characteristic. That's, that's interesting, not least in the sense that it doesn't map well to their behavior in, in accessing materials that I showed you just a moment about, where freely available materials online are clearly important to a much higher share of respondents. Now, um, now we also have um, have looked at uh, publishing services. There's been so much talk about the value of publishers and the kinds of new publishing services that scholars might find interesting or that the community might find valuable. Um, and so we've added a couple of modules of questions about publishing services. This module is about relatively 
traditional publisher services, things like managing the peer review process and um, associating your work with a reputable brand that signals its quality, or placing your article in a high visibility publication or channel. And, um, and our respondents, um, about 60% plus or, or, uh, or minus, um, as high as 70 or 75% at the top, report that these, character, these, uh, these attributes of a publisher are important to them, are very important to them. And, um, and, and, and I, wanna, I wanna just uh, emphasize that it's about two thirds that, um, that report that. Now, by contrast, when we ask um, a, a different question about newer kinds of publishing services, some of which might be um, offered by a publisher, but others of which might be offered by a library or a society or, or any n a number of other kinds of support providers. Things like managing my public web presence um, or helping me to assess the impact of my publication or determine where to publish to maximize my impact um, or, or so forth. We see a much lower share of respondents who say that these these types of support services are valuable to them. Um, so managing my public web presence, there, there are some disciplinary differences that I'll emphasize here. Managing my public web presence comes in at about 40% of respondents. Um, assessing and then helping me, do my, the impact and then helping me determine where to publish is a little bit lower, not least because scientists find those roles especially less valuable. Um, and, then, and then finally, um, making a version of my research outputs freely available, that's services that many libraries run with an institutional repository, um, uh, and helping me understand and negotiate favorable, um, favorable publication contracts uh, are, are also, uh, you can see um, the disciplinary pattern on, on the latter of those. So in general, what I think we're seeing about the research dissemination patterns um, is a relatively and, and I say relatively traditional mindset in terms of in terms of who my audience is, who my um, what the characteristics are that motivate me to choose a journal, and then the kinds of services that I value in a publisher or the other kinds of support services that I value in the publication process. Um, as you've seen, we don't have trend line data for several of these questions where um, it will be very interesting to see whether the trend line is up or down on them, and we 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 just can't know. Um, but that's a snapshot of where things were earlier this academic year. Um, so, so the role of the library is one that intersects with both, um, both issues around discovery and access and of course thinking about new kinds of services, not least some of those um, dissemination support services that, that I was just uh, referencing a moment ago. And, um, and I want to start here, I'd like to start with um, the, a question that we've been sharing um, for a number of cycles of this project, asking about the functions of your college and university or, or university library, um, and, and understanding how important they are to you. Uh, the first three here are the original ones that we've been asking um, since 2003, and they're a little bit more collections oriented. They're about discovery. They're about preservation. They're about um, they're about. Uh, buying things. Um, and then the latter three we've been encouraged to add over the course of the last several cycles. They're more services roles like s facilitating faculty teaching or helping to support the research of faculty members or finally working with undergraduate students to help them with information literacy and, and research skills, uh, research skills uh, needs. Um, and so here's the snapshot of how things looked earlier this academic year. You can see that the buyer role continues um, to be in, in, uh, in first place. 80% of our respondents think the role of the academic library in buying things for them or licensing things for them is, um, is very important. Um, the gateway and repository roles are in a sort of second place position. Um, and then the, um, the services roles are a little bit lower than that, but the information literacy item um, comes in at the highest of the three, of the three services roles. Now, I'd like, to, I'd like to provide a little bit more granularity on this because I, I believe there's a great deal of explanatory power in, in this particular um, question module. Um, so here's how things have changed over the course of time, tracking back to 2003. You can see that, let me start with the gateway all the way on the left. The gateway item has from 2003 to 2006 to 2009 been seemingly declining steadily. Um, and that, that steady decline maps with, if I can recall your attention to one of the discovery items, to that steady decline in the perception that researchers are starting with their online library catalog. Um, and then just as with that item, so here, 
the gateway role has, the decline in the gateway role has been interrupted and indeed modestly reversed. Um, that's, that's a really interesting finding that once again um, seems like it could have something to do with some of the choices that libraries have been making in this area in, um, in recent years. Now, with the sole exception of the gateway role, there are another four roles that we have been tracking at least since 2009. And you can see that those other four roles, buyer, repository, teaching facilitator, and research supporter, have all declined in perceived importance uh, by the uh, respondents to our survey. Um, the information literacy item is new with this cycle, so we, we can't know what its, what its trend line may, uh, may look like. But again, the fact that all of the others have declined really sets the gateway's uh, uh, modest increase in fairly stark relief. There also are very powerful patterns by disciplinary grouping. Um, the buyer role is equally is seen as equally important is seen as important by equal shares of respondents in each of the three disciplinary groupings but with the sole exception of the buyer role um, the scientists are a, a, a dramatically lower share in most cases of scientists report viewing each of these library roles as very important um, th compared with social scientists compared with humanists so that pattern of more humanists uh, than social scientists and more, scienti more social scientists than scientists is very, very consistent with the exception of the buyer, the buyer role here. Um, in 2010, in the fall of 2010, we conducted a survey of library deans and directors um, on a number of issues, one of which was this exact question. Um, and so right now I'd like to show you how um, faculty members from 2012, uh, those are the blue bars, compare with uh, uh, a national survey of library deans and directors, those are the green bars. Um, you can see that for every role, really with the exception of the buyer role, um, our, our library deans and directors, a higher share of them thought that was a very important role of the library as compared to the aggregate response level of faculty members. Um, but the differences are, are much starker, clearly, in the, in the three roles on the bottom, the three services roles on the bottom. Um, and in part because we knew that the library directors felt so strongly about these roles and especially about the um, information literacy role, we wanted to dig in a little bit more deeply into perceptions about that particular role. Um, so, um, so we gave a strongly worded statement. My undergraduate students have poor skills relating to locating and evaluating scholarly information. 44% of our respondents agree strongly with, uh, with that statement. Um, again, whether that's too high or too low, I'll, I'll leave to others to try to interpret. Um, but, um, but, uh, but, but we use that as the uh, jumping off point to think about whose responsibility it is to develop those skills. So this is uh, two strongly worded statements that I'm going to show together. Developing the research skills is primarily the responsibility of, and then we have my responsibility, 42% uh, uh, believe that it's their responsibility, and we offer it in a separate item, my academic library's responsibility, and about a quarter uh, agreed that it's their academic library responsibility. So that wasn't a forced choice. You could have answered both of those, um, or of course neither of those, and that was the pattern, uh, that was the, uh, the pattern that emerged. Now, finally, in trying to understand the changing perceptions about the role of the academic library, um, we have two very strongly worded statements that are, are a little bit, um, they're, they're hard statements, um, and I'll, I'll let you read them, but they're both really about um, when content moves online, what is your perception of the role of the librarian? Um, and I want to emphasize that the one is strictly about librarians and the other is about buildings and staff. But they're really about now that content is online, how do the other things that the library do, how important um, is, are the other things that the library do, do uh, the other things that the library does? Um, and, and in both cases, we have, in the cases of both of those questions, we see that it's, it remains a decisive minority, a decisive minority that agree strongly um, that, that the role librarians play is becoming less important um, or that, that, that universities should redirect the money they spend to other needs. Um, but you can see the trend line there has been steady over the course of, of, um, of three cycles of the survey now. And, um, and we're, uh, we're, you know, think that that's an important uh, finding to call to attention. 
Now, finally, we've been focusing on format transitions in this, sur uh, this survey si uh, process for some number of its cycles. And, um, and, and we'll, I'll look quickly at journals, but then I also want to show you what we've found about monographs, which is a, new, a relatively new area for us to look at here. Um, so w with the journals format transition, I'm going to start with a question that was really directed uh, to, um, to publishing and then a second one that's more directed to collecting. Uh, the first one is I'm completely comfortable essentially with publishers ceasing to issue print versions at all, just as long as they're available electronically. The second one is I'm, I'm, if my library canceled the print version but continued to collect it electronically, that would be fine with me. So we, um, we have both a publisher version and a library version. With respect to the publisher version, we have in 2012, the green bars, 60% of scientists, uh, about 55% of social scientists, and a full 40% of humanists agreeing strongly fine to cease issuing print uh, versions, uh, which has grown um, uh, steadily from from 2009. And with respect to library choices, and this is a great example where we have data but not really a strong hypothesis, uh, you can see that while the pattern had been uh, over time that libraries can cease collecting print versions from 2003 to 2006 to 2009, that trend has been arrested and indeed there's a modest fall off from, um, uh, uh, from 2009 to 2012 in all three disciplinary groupings. I, I don't have a great explanation of what that would be so that, that's something that we're, we're eager to discuss. Now thinking about uh, back files, we have a couple of strongly worded statements about back files as well. Um, I would be happy to see hard copy collections discarded and replaced entirely by electronic collections. And then secondly, it will always be crucial for some libraries to maintain hard copy collections. Um, so with respect to the first one, um, I'd be happy to see collections discarded, a pretty strong uh, statement for, um, for academic faculty members. Uh, you can see that uh, approximately 50% of scientists and social scientists agree strongly with that statement. Um, and the share of humanists that do so is now at about 30%. So, um, so I, we, you know, there certainly seems like a bit of a leveling off for the social sciences and the sciences, um, and we may be hitting a plateau or not. It's hard to tell, and this is uh, one of the reasons why we're interested in continuing to track change over the course of time. Um, with respect to whether some libraries should continue to maintain uh, copies of print journals, uh, the back file, uh, the hard copy collections. Um, we've seen, again, a steady decline over time that really hasn't declined from 2009 to 2012, not at all for social sciences and sciences. And that also maps uh, nicely with the last question that I showed you where there was that plateau in the increase. Um, and so, and so it's, um, it seems like at least over the past three years we haven't seen major change on, on either of those two items. Now, with respect to monographs, um, mo monographs. There's been so much activity in thinking about ebooks and scholarly monographs over the past over the past few years. So we asked for the first time a very simple question: How often have you used scholarly monographs in digital form in the past six months? The share that reports that they do so either often or occasionally um, comes to 70 percent, right on the nose. 70 percent of respondents indicate that they've done so often or occasionally. Um, and, um, and that's the, the blue and the green uh, uh, slices of the pie there. Um, but we know that it, when you get an, a response like that, there's something more complicated than they've just switched to ebooks altogether going on, or at least we suspected that that might be the case. So we introduced a question that was designed to explore different use cases for monographs and try to understand um, what the, what, which of them were seen as favoring print and which of them were seen as favoring digital. Um, and so the top two are about reading in depth, uh, the middle two comparing treatment between monographs and skimming monographs, and then the bottom two are more exploratory or searching behaviors. And we have a very interesting pattern that emerges. The top two, cover to cover or other kinds of in-depth reading, decisive shares of our, response, of our respondents say that those use cases favor print over digital books right now for them. And then on the bottom two use cases, the more exploratory or search-like behaviors, again, decisive shares of our respondents have said that 
uh, that digital forms, that they favor digital forms over print for those types of use cases. And then the middle two are somewhere in, somewhere in the middle. So it seems as though, it seems as though there's a real pattern emerging whereby at least today, um, and not to say what will happen in the future, but at least today we may be in a bit of a middle state where there are different, there clearly are different use cases and, and different use cases that favor different formats. Um, one question about monographs that we have been tracking over time is this one. This, is, this will strike many of you, I think, as a very strongly worded statement. Within the next five years, the use of e-books will be so prevalent among faculty and students that it will not be necessary to maintain library collections of hard copy books. And in 2006 and 2009, it tracked at plus or minus four percentage points. A trivial share of our respondents agreed strongly with that statement. A share that has essentially quadrupled since then to 16% uh, agreeing strongly with that statement. Still, of course, a tiny share of respondents agreeing strongly with it. But the beginnings of what appears to be a trend line, and of course, if some of those in-depth reading behaviors were addressed with e-books to the satisfaction of our respondents, it would be interesting to see how this trend line uh, would advance, if at all. So um, that is a very um, brief overview of some of the key findings that we have to share from the national, the random national sample of U.S. Uh, of U.S. Uh, academics. Um, I want to take a minute to acknowledge um, my co-authors on the project, Ross Housewright, who's here, and Kate Wolfson, um, who, uh, who, who've both made uh, substantial contributions to this very complicated effort. Um, the report itself will be available on Monday at, at this URL, um, and we look forward to um, engaging with all of you in a variety of ways about what, what all this means. So let me turn it back to Deanna now. Thank you. Thanks, Roger. I'm sure each of you, as you looked at these survey results, looked at uh, those questions that were particularly interesting to you. And I think we each will look at these survey results through our own lenses. And it won't surprise you that I looked at this uh, result through the eyes of a librarian. And there are four, four topics um, that I just want to raise with you. And I hope to have continuing conversations with many of you about this over time. It seems to me there's some, some very good news in this survey. Uh, good news for libraries and good news for publishers. Specifically on the topic of discovery, it seems good news from the library's perspective that the investment in discovery tools that we've made appears to be paying off. I underscore that it's much too early to call this a trend. We don't really know that it's a trend, but, but it is interesting to look at the data and see that this is probably going on. Um, the use of the library's website is coming at the expense of specialized databases, and we can expect vendors to be highly competitive in trying to regain the starting point status that they've had in the past. So I, I expect a lot of activity will be taking place in this arena over the next few years, but really looking forward to the next survey to see if this continues. Uh, the second piece of good news, I think, is for the academic publisher. Faculty continue to have high regard for the traditional functions of the academic publisher, and they show no indication of abandoning traditional publishers as the disseminators of their work. And um, that was, uh, I, I thought that was a very interesting trend in light of everything else that's going on. The, the second issue that I've listed here is just a question. I, I'm really puzzled by the response to the questions about freely accessible materials. Even though the buyer role is the library role most valued by faculty, the number of faculty who report looking for freely accessible resources on the web when they need them, um, I think is, is just puzzling. Um, they say that they find much of what they want on freely accessible resources, and I'm wondering if that's because they are seeing resources that are made available by the library and they just don't understand 
that they're being made available by the library, or are they, uh, are they really saying that faculty are now so prolific in posting their materials on the web that they can go to the web and find uh, what they want? It, that seems unlikely to me. So I'm, you know, that's something I just want to dig into more deeply and find out what's really going on there. And the, the final piece is, I think, a bit of bad news. I see clear warning signs for librarians as they think about new services. <clears throat> librarians often talk about moving from a collections focus to a services focus. And I suspect that many of the services that have been uh, developed or aimed at undergraduates and it, that may be the reason that faculty are not perceiving the value of these new services. Um, the faculty still show a very strong appreciation for the collections role. And I think if librarians want to be appreciated for these new services, uh, they have a lot of work to do. So those are uh, just a few observations I thought I would share, but I'm really interested in hearing from all of you later about what, what you thought was most important about these results. And the other part we want to share with you this afternoon is um, a little bit of information from one institution's faculty survey. Um, we have, we think that the national survey is, is a powerful tool in tracking trends over time, looking at behaviors and practices. But we've always been keenly aware that institutional differences are definitely there. And these national trends may in fact mask some of the institutional differences. So we're really grateful to 11 partners who worked with us this year to develop the institutional survey and um, it gives us a chance to see what's really going on on different campuses and then begin to understand what happens on that campus to cause these differences. I think those will be particularly rich discussions to have in the future. Uh, as Cliff mentioned in the beginning, Judy Russell uh, has has been such a great asset. She has worked with us on the advisory committee. She has run this survey on her campus. And we're pleased that she's here to talk about the, the very first look at her, uh, her findings at the University of Florida. Judy. Good. Take a moment here to close one presentation and open another, so. Hopefully. Okay, we'll close that one too. Okay, there we go. All right, so. So as uh, Deanna indicated, um, when uh, the folks at Ithaca indicated that they were interested in piloting uh, having local surveys done. I was very quick to say that I was very interested in doing that. I've followed the results of the national survey with interest since its inception and I agree it, it challenges us in lots of ways and it's very interesting to see the trends over time. But um, having the opportunity to do it as a, the same questions as a local survey and to try to understand how the views of our faculty compare with those national views, I think is going to be extremely helpful to us. Um, it will let us, I think, engage in a much more specific dialogue about our strategic directions with our campus when we can talk with them about these national trends, but also what we see as, as their responses. We just completed the survey in mid-March and the folks at Ithaca rushed to get us some early results. So what you're seeing is very preliminary data, which is a little tantalizing um, because we haven't had time to really dig down in it very much yet. And we certainly haven't had a chance to separate it out by discipline and, and really look at that very closely. But I think you'll find it interesting and it certainly is already starting us uh, thinking about what we want to do with the data in comparison to the national data. Um, what I've chosen to share with you today, because it was kind of uh, what we found most interesting most quickly in the data, 
is areas where UF differed significantly from the national data. So uh, what you'll see, I think, are some things that will, um, maybe you'll join with me in speculating about why we're seeing different things. But So um, for the Ithaca survey, you heard Roger say that they had specifically excluded agriculture and health in their survey sample over all of this period of time. For UF, um, agriculture and health are huge portions of our campus. Uh, you can see here they're 73 percent of our funded research. It's a significant portion of our faculty and our students. So we did decide to include them in our survey and that's clearly going to cause us to have somewhat different results. Um, the Ithaca response rate was about three and a half percent uh, with 33 percent of it from the sciences. Our response rate was 5.4 Four, six, so 5.4, 5.5%, .5%. but we had 56% of our respondents from the sciences. So again, you're going to see some skewing, I think, by uh, when you do the comparison because we have such a heavy response from the sciences. Um, and I followed some of these same questions that you've just uh, done with um, Roger, so you'll kind of see how those play out. So for known item searches, UF is different than the national in some pretty significant ways. So where nationally 41% were beginning with the library website, for us 46% begin with a specific scholarly database. So it's flipped for us. Our people are starting in scholarly databases rather than in the library website. Be interesting as we dig deeper to find out about that. For the new item searches, um, we're roughly comparable on the percentage that uh, uses the library website, but significantly higher on those who use the specific scholarly database. So Diana was talking about the usage of those general search engines. So apparently our people are using the general search engines less and coming to specific uh, databases that are known to them, scholarly databases, to begin their research. Some, this is, I think, one of the most interesting questions. Um, so of the respondents who strongly agreed that the statement about the next five years ebooks will be so prevalent that it will not be necessary to maintain library book collections, nationally 16%. In the research level one institutions, which include UF, the national results, it dropped to 12%. But then for UF, it went up to 22%. So there's a stronger than the national average statement about a diminishing need for library book collections at UF than in its peer research institutions. And one of the things we'll be doing with this data is looking at our results against the R1 institutions as well as against the national data uh, because it'll be interesting to see w whether some of the differences are um, more between national data and R1 data or whether they are significant um, even within the R1 class. Um, the issue about respondents not caring if print journals are canceled, 68% um, of the national group, 70% of the R1, 78% at UF. So another place where there's a distinct difference in our response to that particular question. Similarly, we have sort of a tiered approach on this one about uh, comfortable with journals ceasing to print. 53% nationally, 56% in R1, 69% at UF. Again, a significant difference that we're seeing in our population that will, um, I think, lead to some interesting dialogue on campus, but also some interesting excavation of the data to see if we can try to determine why that's occurring. Um, the question about electronic monographs being very important in research and teaching, 54% overall, 57% R1, 60% for UF, so we're higher, but not as dramatically higher as we've been on a couple of those other questions. And for the question about, um, and this was one that Roger didn't use in his examples, but one that we found particularly interesting, so I'm sharing it with you. Three to four percent of the respondents overall reported replacing in-person laboratory exercises with digital simulations, and five percent in the R1 group. Twenty-five percent of our respondents indicated that they're replacing in-person laboratory exercises with digital simulations. So um, something different is happening on our campus, uh, clearly, and 
again, it's something where we're, we've seen enough to be tantalized and not enough to have a conclusion, but uh, obviously it's, it's an area that will lead us to, uh, to look at it. And uh, then on the primary responsibility of the library, and I have used these last two questions that, uh, that Roger did uh, use as well. So where 56% of the national respondents say that the library's re primary responsibility is research and teaching, 66% in the R1s, so it is higher in the R1s, but 78% at the University of Florida. Now we did also see that we had a higher percentage of faculty who teach at the graduate level respond to our survey, and that may be part of what's reflected in this particular response. Uh, but again, something that will bear some further ex investigation. And then on the question about the responsibility of the library for undergraduate student, student learning, our response is lower. So it was 55% nationally, it dropped to 40 for the R1s, and for us it's still lower at 37. So you can see that there will be, I think, significant value as always to taking this national data and really studying it and really examining it, but it will be, I think, very much informed by our ability to use this same data uh, and compare ourselves to the R1 group and uh, to know specifically what's happening on our own campus. So I think this has been a really um, interesting opportunity. It's, I think, fulfilled more than even my expectations about what it would bring to us as an institution in terms of how we um, work with our faculty on our strategic planning. And I'm really hopeful that we will then now be able to continue to do this in a future year so that we'll begin to see the trends and see whether our faculty are moving closer to the norms over time or whether they're continuing to stretch out. So uh, stay tuned in a couple of years. We'll maybe the three of us will be back and we'll be uh, giving you a, a, a reprise. But um, I think we'll publish more information about this when we've had time to dig into it and share it. So you'll see some uh, additional results. And uh, I think it will probably help Ithaca as they begin to get the results from these other institutions as well. We're particularly interested in comparing with Texas A&M and uh, Illinois because they are also our ones. And so it'll give us a, a good idea of are they seeing differences in their local results as well. So uh, with that, I'll turn it back over, I guess, to the, to Deanna and she'll help us with the Q&As. Thank you. Uh, let me first thank Roger and Judy uh, for their very interesting presentations. They've gone through a lot of data and uh, uh, I, we've tried hard to present these data visually so that you can get quick glimpses, but we hope you will read the report thoroughly on uh, Monday and, and then let us know more. At this time, we invite you uh, to ask questions or make comments, uh, anything you'd like to raise with us. We'll just sit here and the questions can be addressed to any, any one of us. Thanks. I wonder when the report is released uh, on Monday, I appreciate you may not have been able to present this now, will there be something that gives us some idea of what the, the confidence intervals are around those percentages you expressed? I'm, I'm concerned that, for instance, in the presentation for Florida, it's difficult simply seeing percentage A compared with percentage B to know at this stage whether we're seeing a real difference uh, or, or just uh, an apparent one that isn't actually statistically significant. Yeah, it's a, it's a, a good question, Kevin. Um, the, um, the, the plan is uh, in the report itself, it will have, um, it'll have graphs that look substantially similar to the ones here, but um, we can certainly say a lot more about, about those issues, and I'd be happy to share some more, some more information about that sort of thing. Okay, thanks. Thank you. David. Uh, Maybe influence by me being at Stanford, but I'm particularly interested in the differences be, uh, that Florida's seen because I think a lot of them are due to their inclusion of the health sciences. Mm -hmm. uh, our um, subjective impression at Stanford is that the health sciences have a strong bias to technological optimism. And I think that's showing in a lot of their, res the, um, in what I'm guessing are their uh, influence on those results. And so I think that uh, 
although there are going to be some issues around, uh, I have the same concerns that Kevin does about the small sample size, I think there are going to be some very interesting results out of um, when there's, if you can break out the health sciences from the sciences in general. Um, and I think that is very much our expectation that we're going to separate out health and agriculture. We actually had the highest response rate from any single college was from the College of Agriculture. So um, it may really, in our case, be agriculture just simply because they were more responsive to the survey. But um, I agree with you that we're going to want to be able to separate the agriculture and health sciences from the other sciences so we can compare to the normalized data across the rest of the survey more effectively. And you'll see that, I think, as we release more of our data. Is there uh, just general CNI fatigue at this moment? Or? <laughs> There's another question. Uh, would you come to the microphone, Howard? It's a simple question. Will you release the full data set or just the summary? Yes, that's an easy answer also. Oh, um, we've been, for, for the national uh, survey, we've been depositing the data set with ICPSR for, um, for access and preservation purposes, and we're in the process of cleaning, cleaning it up for that submission right now. So we hope it will be available shortly through, through ICPSR. And we would be interested, too, in hearing of if, if you do analyses of the data, we would love hearing from you about what you did and what you found. Uh, that would be extremely useful. I have a question about um, your uh, future plans. Do you have any plans to um, assess other groups in the academy, such as undergraduates? And the reason I ask this is, um, some preliminary studies on their likability for or use of ebooks. Um, it, it was provoked by the uh, the graph that you showed about how print versus e is being used, and so you, one could argue that faculty know how to look for sources and citations and things inside an electronic environment, but undergraduates may not know that yet. Right. Well, uh, you'll, you'll be interested to know that I'm carrying in my briefcase a, a, a rather uh, compelling argument from my colleague here uh, that we should be uh, doing a survey of undergraduates as well. And so we're, we're really looking into what we can do. Um, we, we're beginning to see a kind of cycle where we have a faculty survey one year, um, a survey of deans and directors of libraries the second year, and a survey of students the third year, if, if we can manage all of that. Um, we, we hope to, but I, I can't say definitively yet. We're still looking at it. But I think we would see very interesting results. Tom Leonard from Berkeley. Uh, at the University of California, the system, we spent a lot of time assuring faculty that um, although we would be removing, for example, um, print journals from the local shelves, we were keeping a repository copy or even more recently, maybe out of state in a, in a consortium like West. Right. So knowing that, I would have had trouble answering the questions that talked about discarding or getting rid of, or I think discarding was the word in the survey, if they knew we were keeping a print copy, they might agree to the local copy being given out. On the other hand, some people are more radical, I suppose, and they wouldn't care if there was a paper copy available anywhere within our clutches. Uh, it's a it's a great it's a great question, um, and we've been I re, I only reported in the presentation today a few of the questions that are on that on that topic, but there are a few more in the full report, and um, and you know overall what we're what we're um, looking at really is just their attitudinal reactions, their almost emotional reactions to the possibility of different scenarios. So that hopefully each of those scenarios can can help you triangulate what what might make most sense for your for your institution or your uh, consortial dynamics. While we're waiting to see if someone else has a question, I'll make a comment to Deanna because I too am interested in the idea of a student survey, but I would encourage you not to limit it just to undergraduates because I think it would be very interesting to see the difference as they progress through their academic career 
between the undergraduates and the graduates who then ultimately become faculty. Um, so I would encourage you to, to think about that full Thank strata. You. Good, good point. Thanks. All right. All right. Thank so you. Done. As they said, the whole data set is going to be available, and um, I think you got some sense from, you know, just what Judy was uh, sampling through of a few ex um, extracts, how much is going to be in there to look at. For example, you know, how different are the R1s than the aggregate, and um, so I think you've given us a... Uh, very um, rich resource to uh, learn from over the coming months and years. Um, please join me in thanking um, our uh, closing plenary team again um, for giving us this, uh, this preview of the report. Um, it's really been very helpful and uh, it's, it's very provocative to see these trend lines. Um, uh, lots to think about here. Thank you again. And with that, we're adjourned. I wish you safe travels. I look forward to seeing many of you in the coming months and lots and lots of you in December. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>